I want to next introduce Tony and Grafia, your program. We're switching Tony and Lou here. Tony is the Dwight C. Baum Professor of Engineering and Engineering and Weiss Presidential Teaching Fellow at Cornell University. Since 1974, he has conducted research and development in various aspects of oil and gas drilling, cementing, fracking, and pipeline science, engineering, and technology. And I know from personal experience that Tony knows how to lobby in Albany, too. So thanks, Tony. Thank you, Martha, and thank all of you for coming tonight. Um, I'm going to do something which I think you came here to hear, which is a critique of certain elements of the draft generic environmental impact statement. Um, but before I do that, I think we should all make sure we understand just what an environmental impact statement is and is not. Um, and then Lou and I have decided to take certain elements of the impact statement and analyze them in terms of what impacts are being addressed and what mitigation or prohibition measures are being proposed. So first, just briefly, what is an environmental impact statement? What's it supposed to do? Uh, well, it's supposed to identify potential impacts to the environment, and then it's supposed to assess those for their potential severity, and then it's supposed to propose either mitigation to reduce that severity, or if the severity is judged in the impact statement to be too severe a severity, it's supposed to propose a prohibition. So as near as I can tell, after reading, reading 1,075 pages, there's not very much prohibition. Never mind. Um, but there is a lot of proposed mitigation. But remember, the GEIS is not the law of the land. It is not a regulatory document. It is not a legally binding document. It, all it can do is either propose mitigation or propose prohibition. So those of you who have been reading the GEIS notice that very frequently you'll see a phrase like the DEC proposes to require via permit condition and or regulation that something should be mitigated or prohibited. So I've circled in red these because at the end of the GEIS there's a rulemaking period that's supposed to occur in which either mitigation is enforced by permit condition or regulation or there's a prohibition by permit condition or regulation. So with that as now a common understanding of what an EIS is, I'm going to proceed to take only two of the hundreds in that over 1,000 page document, only two items that have been identified as potential environmental impacts for which mitigation procedures or mitigation recommendations uh, have been stated. So those are these two. So my focus tonight is only on two of those elements because I think they're both important from a local point of view because they affect people's underground sources of drinking water and from a global point of view because they affect climate change. So I think I've got everybody encapsulated there. You're either local or you're global. If you're not, you shouldn't be here. <laughs> so the first is the emission of gases with global warming potential due to natural gas dr well drilling and production. So this is an extract taken directly from Table 11.1. So for those of you who haven't started reading this yet, it's daunting. I suggest you go to the last page. Because unfortunately, the people who wrote the SGEIS waited until the last page to give everybody a roadmap for how to read the document. The last page is Table 11.1. .1. It's 20 pages. But in that table, the various potential impacts are identified, like this one. And then it takes you to the proper section in the GEIS where the proposed mitigation or prohibition is described. It's a roadmap. That's where you start. Start with the last page. So the two I'm going to look at are this one and this one, contamination of groundwater aquifers and natural gas, drilling fluids, or high volume hydraulic fracturing fluids in the well bore. So let's do the first one. All right, so the SGEIS identifies a potential environmental impact from global greenhouse gas emissions resulting from carbon dioxide from burning natural gas and methane from the emission of natural gas. And the first thing it cites is an industry source. You were supposed to get that. The first thing our science document cites is not a referee journal publication in the science literature. It cites Chesapeake Energy Corporation's July 2009 fact sheet in which it claims that methane has a global warming potential 23 times that of carbon dioxide. 
Well, that was interesting information. It was accurate in 1996. <laughs> However, they go on to say, global, global warming potential factors are continually being updated. Yes, they are. And the GIS ignored the most recent update. <laughs> so they then go on to say, well, we're required to do this assessment, and we're going to pick the 100-year global warming potential. So in assessing whether methane or carbon dioxide is more lethal in terms of, or more serious in terms of global warming potential, you have to pick a time period. It's called a time horizon. And typically, currently in the science literature, those time horizons are 20 years, 100 years, and 500 years. I don't think anybody in the room should be concerned about the 500-year time horizon. The 100-year time horizon, if you're concerned about your kids and grandkids, should also not be of concern to you. If you're concerned about what's going to happen in the next generation with climate change, you should be most concerned about the 20-year time horizon. Our GEIS, ours, says forget the 20 years, let's go to 100 for reasons you're about to see. So here's a table, and it says, hmm, methane is 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide over 100 years. It's 72 times more potent than carbon dioxide over 20 years, but that's a big number, so they ignored it, in my opinion. But both of these numbers are incorrect. They don't reflect current science. They reflect 15-year-old science. So the GEIS does cite the current paper by the Duke University scientists, but does not cite the current paper by the Cornell University scientists, either the economic scientists or the climate scientists. So there's obviously a prejudice in Albany against Cornell, so those of you from Cornell should say something. So the point is that the current SGIS ignores much more recent research on global warming potential and the difference between high volume hydraulic fracturing and, well, and conventional wells, there's a word, word missing here, and conventional wells and methane emissions. So for example, the correct number here is not 25, as Chesapeake would say, it's 33. And the correct number here is not 72, it's 105. Okay. Uh, and then the SGIS goes on to cite an the only, only thing I can figure is it's a mistake. Uh, it says that the estimated first year greenhouse gas emissions from a single conventional vertical well are more than those from a horizontal well. What? <laughs> it's got to be a mistake. I hope they'll catch it. It can't be correct. Uh, then they go on to say that if you have four wells, you don't get four times as much emission. You only get less than twice. Okay. So what is all this business about methane? Now we're going to get into the video portion. So you're going to have to excuse me. I'm going to go back and forth to the computer here because I have to fire up some DVDs and some uh, movies. So I want to make sure you understand what I'm talking about when I say that there is methane being emitted. All right, this is a FLIR video, forward-looking infrared, ra uh, infrared radar. It shows what you can't see with a human eye. That's methane being emitted from the completion, actually the finishing, of a well uh, in Susquehanna County. Those clouds are methane. You would not be able to see them by the naked eye. This is what happens after the flowback, during the flowback period, when the gas is not flared, but rather it's vented. And our SGEIS gives the industry the choice. You can vent or you can flare. Uh, so that's methane emissions. And that's in black and white. The other one is false color. But anything you see here as cloud is methane. Okay. Let me come back to the PowerPoint and show you the next source. Okay, now I'm going to show you something on a DVD. Again, through FLIR, you're going to see a video taken of a compressor station, again, in Susquehanna County. And you're first going to see it with regular video, like you would get with your DVD video, and then you're going to see it in FLIR. In the first video, you won't see anything, and when you get to the color, you'll see methane. Sorry for this bouncing back and forth. Now, 
start this where I want to start it so you can see both the before and the after. So this gas compressor station, this is what you won't see from gas compressor stations with the naked eye. That's what it looks like to the naked eye. This is what it looks like under FLIR. And those of you who live in Ellis Hollow, anybody live in Ellis Hollow? Drive by the compressor station and turn on a FLIR and that's what you'll see. Okay, so those are two sources of methane. Uh, and as we say in our study at Cornell University, they're very substantial sources, uh, and I think that they're being drastically underestimated in the SGEIS. One other one, you've heard about the incidence of bubbling of methane in, in the Susquehanna River and bubbling in various creeks. I'll show you a video of bubbling. But when you look at this, you have to understand that it's easy to see gas bubbling in a creek or a lake. You can't see gas bubbling in the woods. So for every incident of gas bubbling in a creek or a lake, you have to ask, and this question hasn't been asked, it hasn't been addressed in the SGEIS, how many incidences of methane migration to the surface, not to underground sources of drinking water, have been detected? Or are they even being measured in a regional sense? And the answer is no. I can find nothing in the SGEIS that indicates that that study has been done. This was a trout stream. So as you can guess, this is the result of inadequately engineered or inadequately constructed or inadequately maintained wells. And clearly, the larger the number of wells, the more incidents like this we're going to have because, as I'm about to point out, it is impossible to build a well that does not leak. You can quote me on that. Um, so what does the SGIS propose as mitigation measures? Well, they say, we're going to require the development of a greenhouse gas emission impact mitigation plan. In other words, the SGIS suggests the creation of an assessment of a mitigation. I think I follow that. Uh, it requires the development of a leak detection and repair program, and leak detection and repair programs are part of the U.S. EPA's Natural Gas STAR program for which the GEIS encourages participation, does not require it. It also requires reduced emission completions only where a gathering pipeline is already in place. So all those emissions I showed you, especially the clouds of gas coming off at completion, that can happen if the company says, we don't have a gathering line in place. So I think those are fairly um, uh, mild recommendations for mitigation. Let's move on to the second one very quickly. Uh, the identified impact is the possible contamination of groundwater aquifers from natural gas, drilling fluids, or high-volume high hydraulic fracturing fluids in the well bore, uh, and the proposed mitigation is to specify as a permit condition more stringent casing construction and cementing, and reporting of well information, and testing of the cement job, uh, all of which are currently required. So I don't know what's new here, but I want to pick on one of those items, the one that's underlined in red, because in the making the announcement of the new SGEIS, uh, there was a fact sheet that was distributed. Um, and I'll show you that fact sheet in a minute, but let's make sure you understand what we all mean when we say migration from a well. So um, that's natural gas coming up outside the well. Hear it? Okay, so that natural gas is going into the atmosphere. It will continue to go into the atmosphere for the life of the well. It's also possible that that migration outside the well could cause underground migration of methane and any other hydrocarbons mixed with the methane into an underground source of drinking water. This happens frequently. So the GEIS says there's going to be a new intermediate casing that's going to, and I underline, let I me mean, make sure you understand this. It says it's to prevent the migration of gas. That's got to be an incorrect word choice. I can't believe that the GEIS would tend to lie to us to say that using something that they're already using is going to prevent something that's already happening. <laughs> so the new intermediate casing, I want to emphasize, is not new. Uh, I'm showing you here two schematics, one for each of two wells from Dimmick, Pennsylvania, 
where there is one, two, three, four, five layers of casing. This well failed. In fact, this is a schematic of the well I just showed you bubbling. Uh, here's another one. Uh, one, two, three, four layers of casing. The point is that at least three layers of casing and frequently four or five or six layers of casing are used in high volume uh, hydraulic fracturing of wells in shale formations. So I think the SGIS is being a little bit disingenuous by saying adding a new layer of casing is going to prevent a problem which is chronic. And here's data from the industry that shows how chronic it is. This is a plot that shows the percentage of wells affected by sustained casing pressure as a function of the age of the well. Brand new wells about 5% of the time leak. And of course, wells age. The older they get, the higher the percentage of leakage. Uh, these are offshore wells. Here's data from 360,000 onshore wells. Again, about 4.5% of them leak initially. So uh, I want to conclude by pointing out that the GEIS also made a, a point to say that they learned something from Pennsylvania, and I'm here to tell you if they did, they haven't told us everything they've learned, and I wish they would, and if they haven't learned some things, I hope they go learn them, and here are the things that I don't think they've learned. So the suggested required addition of an intermediate protective layer of casing does not prevent migration, as the GEIS says. It can, to some degree, mitigate it, but it is just another layer of casing, another layer of cement, and it might be the outermost and it might fail. The vast majority of wells that show gas migration have intermediate casing already. This is nothing new. The SGEIS, and this is the most important thing I'm going to tell you tonight, doesn't do, in my opinion, good enough statistical science. We've had four years of operation, 3,500 wells in Pennsylvania and the Marcellus. There is not a single statistical analysis in the SGEIS, as far as I can tell, that says the number of incidents of fluid migration, i.e. the number of con confirmed well water contaminations. How many wells were contaminated? Water wells. DEP has that information. Why doesn't DEC publish it and tell us, here are the odds? It doesn't cite any uh, statistical analysis of the number of blowouts, pipeline failures, pad failures, or any other serious accidents that have occurred. Why not? That's DEP records, it's got to be there. All the DEC has to do is call them and say, send it, put it in GEIS, then we know it. It does not contain any statistical analysis of methane emissions, either vented or fugitive, from the 3,500 wells. So how are we going to assess what the global greenhouse gas impact is going to be in New York State from the 50 to 60,000 wells that the SGEIS predicts will be drilled in New York State over the next 20 years? It does not show any statistical analysis of flowback, produced water, and brine waste volumes. As you know, DEP in the last two years has required the uh, statement from each well operator of what's being produced, and that data has gone on a website at DEP. There should have been a very, very correctly done statistical analysis that says, here's how much comes back from each well, and here's where it went. Instead, they're leaving us to do this. Uh, where did the liquid and solid waste finally go? The data is there in Pennsylvania. I would have hoped that the GEIS would have said, here's where it went the last four years in Pennsylvania. Here are the lessons learned about environmental impact. Here are the mistakes we're not going to make. Here's what we're proposing to do to either prohibit or mitigate those mistakes. I can't find it. And finally, citations and enforcements. Again, DEP has all that information. DEC should have gotten the information, should have published it in the GEIS so that we can judge what level of regulatory observance, control, and enforcement we're going to need for the 2,000 wells per year that GEIS is predicting will be drilled in New York State. So I don't want to be overly critical. I've only picked on two things. There are a lot of things the GEIS current version does much better than earlier versions. But I picked on these two issues because one is very local and especially in upstate New York with so many people on underground sources of drinking water, and we all live in the same climate. So whether the gas is coming out of Pennsylvania or New York, it will affect climate change, and I'd like to have an accurate assessment of that coming from our GEIS. So thank you very much for your attention. Looking forward to Q&A. Thank you so much, Tony. Tony is one of those Cornell scientists, along with Bob Howarth and Rene Santoro, who did the groundbreaking study showing that shale gas is more polluting in terms of greenhouse gases than conventional gas, 
more polluting, more damaging to our climate than diesel or than coal. This is the, this is the research nobody wants you to know about. So this is supposed to be the clean energy. This is supposed to be the bridge to the future. Um, Tony, along with his colleagues, uh, have, have broken that myth wide open. And it's really important for everybody to understand it. So thanks for highlighting that tonight, Tony.